This video introduces simple analytic methods for finding the frequency response. So in an overview, what are we doing? We're defining what is frequency response and why is it useful. We'll get to that later. We want to look at how do I compute frequency response efficiently. And then later on, the videos will start looking at how do I represent frequency response information and how do I use it for feedback loop analysis. This particular video is focusing on how do we compute frequency response. Now the previous video showed what frequency response means. We defined a value, the gain A of omega, as the ratio of an output amplitude to the input amplitude when the input is a sinusoid. So you'll see we had a sine wave going into a system and there's your sine d sine omega t. And then we had an output which asymptotically will also be sinusoid and that could be written as d a sine omega t plus phi. So the ratio of the amplitudes input or output to input is a. Similarly the phase phi of omega is the phase shift or the phase difference between the output signal, you'll see it's got a phi here, and the input signal. Now, it's tedious to estimate A and phi from time responses as in the previous video, so we want to do something a bit cleverer. So what we can do, a more efficient and simple method for determining A and phi assuming, that is, that you know a transfer function model for the system is to use these two formula here. A is the modulus of g of j omega and phi is the argument of g of j omega. In other words, you simply substitute s equal j omega into g of s. You will end up with a complex number and A is the modulus of that complex number and phi is the argument of that complex number. Here's an example then. You'll notice we've got a transfer function up here, g equals 4 of s squared plus 3s plus 2. And what we want to do is find the gain and the phase for this using the analytic approach and then compare that with the sort of answers we got in video 1 when we inferred the gain and phase from time responses. So first of all, let's substitute s equal j omega into g of s and what do we get? We get this formula here. 4 over j omega all squared plus 3j omega plus 2. Now combining all the real parts together and the imaginary parts together we can simplify it to this form here. So next we want to find the gain and the phase. So first you'll see the gain, the modulus of g of j omega. We're just going to use Pythagoras so you'll see we've squared the imaginary part. 3 omega squared gives 9 omega all squared and we squared the real part, <coughs> 2 minus omega squared, all squared, and then put it under a square root. So a fairly simple answer. Similarly, for the phase, the argument of g omega um, is, we've got a 10 to the minus 1 of 3 omega over 2 minus omega squared. That's, if you can see it here, imaginary part divided by real part. But what you need to notice is there's this minus sign here, because of course this complex number was in the denominator. Now, now that we've got the formula, and you'll see we've rewritten them here for you, so you don't lose them, let's substitute in frequencies of 1 radian per second and 2 radians per second and see what we get. First of all then, 1 radian per second. So the modulus of g of j1, so I'm simply going to write omega equals 1 in the formula, and what you get? You get 4 over 9 plus 2 minus 1 all squared and that gives you 4 over root 10, which is 1.26. Similarly for the argument, you get minus 10 to the minus 1 of 3 over 1, which is minus 1.24. For omega equals 2, here are the formula you get, 4 over the root of 36 plus 2 minus 4 all squared, which gives you 4 over root 40, which is 0.63, and for the phase, minus 10 to the minus 1, 6 over minus 2. Now you have to be a bit careful with the quadrant here, but this comes out um, to be minus 1.89 radians. So let's compare those solutions with what we got from video 1. So in video 1, you remember that we had plots like this one here, and we inferred the gain and the phase from those plots. So what did we have? 
This is what we did in video one. We said approximately, and I should emphasize here if I write it, that was an approximation. We weren't particularly careful. We just read it from the graph roughly. We said y is 1.2 sine of t minus 1. Now let's compare that with the analytic solution we've just got on the previous page. And this is what we've got. 1.26 sine of t minus 1.24. So what would you say? Well, our approximation 1.2 was actually pretty close to what we guessed before 1.2. Um, so 1.26, 1.2, they're fairly close together. You might say the phase was a bit further out, but the estimate that we used on video one really was very crude in that time, but at least we're in the right ballpark. What about when we used two radians per second? Well, the estimate, we had 0.62 sine 2t minus 1.8, and the analytic solution, you'll see 0.63, not far from 0.62, minus 1.89, not far from minus 1.8. So the estimates we got were fairly close to the exact values. But you'll probably agree that the computation required to get the exact values is relatively straightforward, so why not do it? Here's a second example then. What if you had a transfer function like this? g equals 2s plus 1 over sq plus s squared plus 3s plus 2. And you want to find the gain and phase for this. Well again, I've just written s equal j omega and substituted it straight in and this is what you get. 2 j omega plus 1 over j omega all cubed plus j omega all squared plus 3j omega plus 2 and again I've combined real and imaginary parts to make life a bit easier so you'll see that the imaginary bit in the denominator is 3 omega minus omega cubed and the real bit 2 minus omega squared so let's find the gain and phase then so the gain <coughs> you'll see from the numerator using our Pythagoras rule you get the root of 4 omega squared plus 1 and for the denominator, the root of 3 omega plus omega cubed all squared plus 2 minus omega squared all squared. And what I'm going to write here, in case it's not obvious, not nice. Yes, you can write it down, but if I asked you to do that in your calculator, you're beginning to say yuck. The phase, not quite so bad, but still not ideal. We've got the phase of the numerator. There it is, 10 to the minus 1 of 2. There's an omega missing there. I apologize. 2 omega over 1. And here's the formula for the denominator, where you'll notice I've put a minus sign because it's the denominator. Again, excuse my spelling, you might be saying things like yuck. Yes, I can do it, but it doesn't look particularly nice. And just a warning there. Please be careful with the phase to make sure you get your answer in the correct quadrant, but we'll talk about that more in later videos. So where's our summary? The general formula for the gain of phase can be written down like this. A of omega is the modulus of g of j omega, which is the square root of the real part of g of j omega all squared plus the imaginary part all squared. And the argument tan to the minus one of the imaginary part of g over the real part of g, but with a query that you've got to be careful about quadrant because an inverse tan is not uh, unique. It only gives you plus or minus 90 degrees. Now, what we've just said is that we're not too keen on these formula because they tend to give you messy solutions. OK, and so what we're going to do in later videos is we're going to show you how you can use multiplication and division of complex numbers to come up with some easier formula, easier to do on your calculator, easier to do on paper, and lending better insight. So con some conclusions. The system output amplitude and phase depend on the frequency of the input signal. We know that. And these formula can be used to determine the gain and the phase. However, a crude computation of these formula leads to very cumbersome expressions and poor insight. And so what we want to do is find some alternative ways of calculating A of omega and phi of omega, which are more efficient and give better insight.